Really, if you think about it, more than 42% of the American population is not protected by these comprehensive food laws. And moving away from the topic of mortality for a minute, we get to this concept of dailies. So dailies basically stand for disability adjusted life years, and it offers a very comprehensive measure that basically combines premature death and also years lived with a disability. Um, sometimes, as we see here in figure four, it will just be broken down into those two separate concepts. So while that stands for years of uh, life lost, and while D stands for years lived with a disability. So according to the Global um, Burden of Disease Study that was conducted recently by the IHME, um, secondhand smoke exposure is actually responsible for nearly 37 million dailies that are lost annually. And among these, as you can see the nice bit, uh, breakdown in figure three, nearly 21% is linked to shemic heart disease, 13% to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and 15% to lung cancer worldwide. All right, and then that brings us to the discussion of the economic impa impact of secondhand smoke and also the disproportionate impact we see that it has in society. It's mainly these disadvantaged populations that are very the right to secondhand smoke impact, and that perpetuates health inequities. Um, individuals who are living in poverty or individuals who live in multi-unit buildings um, face higher levels of smoke exposure. And to kind of put it into perspective, I think most of us are familiar with James Lincoln High School, so let's take that as an example. Let's say someone is smoking in the locker room. You'd think the direct impact of it is maybe that one person who's smoking and maybe the two or three people that are surrounding them. But if you really think about it, that smoke can travel through the doorways, through the vents, and um, even through electrical lines and plumbing systems. So really, the impact is on tens if not hundreds of people. So addressing this issue to enforce comprehensive smoke free policies is really vital for obviously promoting health equity and also for reducing such socioeconomic health disparities. All right, so now we talk about exposure hotspots. So exposure to secondhand smoke in public places can be up to five times higher, and that poses significant, uh, significant risk, especially to a major portion of our food service workforce. And in fact, in the U.S., nearly 24 percent of that actually falls within the age of 15 to 19. Now, there have been economic studies that are conducted in like over 60 various cities and counties with smoke-free restaurant ordinances, and it actually has shown positive results. Um, the sales uh, data uh, pictured here in figure six actually shows that implementing these smoke-free policies can lead to an increase in business for some bars and restaurants. And as we start to really look at the economic burden of second hand smoke, it's honestly staggering because not only does it play significant healthcare costs, it also has productivity loss on a global scale. Um, healthcare costs associated with treating second hand smoke exposure and um, various illnesses that result from it do strain nations. In fact, in 2018, smoking and second hand smoke exposure costs the US nearly $240 billion in um, healthcare spending alone, as well as over $7 billion loss in productivity. Um, due to premature death. And what we also have to consider is that this includes absenteeism, reduced work performance, as well as increased um, health expenses in the toil that can take on an individual and their families. So, of course, the economic consequences really do emphasize the urgent need for these comprehensive smoke free policies to reduce economic exposure, to protect public health, and also alleviate the financial burden that's not only placed on individuals, but also healthcare systems and economies worldwide. So as we start to wrap things up in the conclusion, um, I'd like to talk about some of the best practices in the way forward. So remember, there is no safe level of secondhand smoke exposure. Everyone has the right to breathe clean air, so we really do need, again, these comprehensive smoke-free policies. And these can be implemented in all sorts of indoor workplaces, public transport, schools, and so on, to really ensure the sort of idealistic smoke-free environment. We need stricter laws and regulations to also counter the tobacco industry's harmful advertising practices and false campaigns, as well as like what this forum is all about, increasing awareness to the various hazards of secondhand smoke. Um, we also need to pull, um, encourage collaboration among these international organizations, such as what we saw with the Copyright Collaboration. And it's really essential for conducting evidence-based research and also for providing customized recommendations on effective tobacco control interventions and policies. All right, so um, I'm just going to open the floor to a quick Q&A if anyone has any questions. Yeah? How can the general trend get in place that you have to smoke? So can you repeat that? Yeah, the general trend. A second hand smoking? Yeah. Like so, yeah. Um, again, it does depend on like the countries and the various regions that you're talking about. Um, 
generally the second test of exposure is going to rise, especially with the new different types of smoking apparatuses that we've seen coming to the market. You know, vaping obviously is a big issue, especially among the adolescent population. So, um, yeah, it's really a pressing issue that needs to be kind of solved right now. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Have you noticed an increase or a decrease with second test smoking post COVID and the first you know, that's actually an interesting question, and I haven't done too much research on it. Um, but if I had to go out and say something, I think that individuals who definitely had these sort of pulmonary diseases and illnesses um, might be more aware of the impacts that smoke and second smoke exposure may place on them with them already being in such precarious conditions themselves. Um, I'd have to do more research to get back to one that, though. Did the rating itself increase or decrease the, the track? So, um, my presentation, of course, is not specifically about vaping, so I can't give you too comprehensive an answer on that. But vaping de definitely does contribute to the increase in enhanced smoke exposure we've seen, especially in the adolescent group. Um, vaping is kind of, uh, yeah, it goes back to tobacco industries, um, harmful uh, campaigns, and also false advertising. But it's kind of portrayed as this sort of thing in society where it's like this sort of cool people's thing. And of course, it's targeting a certain uh, demographic, but of course, um, that does increase economic smoke exposure among those particular groups. Um, anyone else? Yes? Um, is it possible for you to go more into detail a little bit about the effects that has on uh, adolescents? Adolescents? Yeah, so when it comes to um, adolescents and, of course, the younger children, um, it's very much like what I shared in the presentation. Of course, children do have you know, weaker immune systems, um, or less developed, I should say, and smaller lungs. So really all of these sort of um, ailments and illnesses that we see happen in the adult population is really magnified in adolescents. If you'd like, I can talk to you after the presentation if you want more um, comprehensive analysis for per se. All right, um, anyone else? I think, all right. So, um, so yeah, I just like to end my presentation with some acknowledgements. Of course, thank you so much to the Newark Library and, of course, to the Library Public Health Forum for giving me a chance to present my work. Um, thank you again, Mr. Q, for bringing this up with me. And also, thank you, my mom, Dr. Masali Garwapati, for connecting us with um, healthcare professionals um, to support us in this. Um, also, thank you to the forums, um, previous to the speakers. So, thank you, Aaron, for your informative presentation. And, of course, this presentation would never have been possible without the work of the countless researchers for conducting the various surveys and studies, the physicians for treating individuals who are facing the health complications of secondhand smoking exposure, and the global health professionals who are working to increase awareness of secondhand smoking. So, from the depths of my heart, thank you to all these individuals. All right, um, that's pretty much it. These are some of my references if you guys are interested in checking them out. Um, again, thank you. If you guys have any questions, again, my name is Shirley Matsumi, and this is my contact information. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah.